Today the update is joined by a renowned author, columnist and political activist Owen Jones. Owen, do you think you'd start by telling us a bit about what you do, who you are and also why you're here at Le Chat? All very good questions. Um, so I'm a writer um, and an activist as you say and uh, I work for the Guardian newspaper so I write columns about various issues in the world, in Britain, globally, politics, social issues and so on. Um, and I write books, so I've written two books about class, the establishment, um, and I'm a broadcaster, so I go on TV, radio, and babble about the world and uh, my opinions on issues. Uh, and I travel all over the place, so mostly in Britain, but obviously in places like this as well. And what I'm interested in in everything I do, whether it's writing or broadcasting or talking, is to try and encourage people to um, confront the injustices that we all face. So to talk about the, what those problems are and, and, and the nature of those problems, but more importantly, I'm interested in trying to encourage people to get active and to and to think that they you know have confidence in their own abilities to be able to change things. Great. Obviously, one of the big problems we face right now is the terrorism from the, the Middle East, uh, particularly the other day, the devastating attacks in Paris and Baghdad and Beirut. And you've been a long-standing supporter of non-intervention in Syria. One of your articles, it's quite a good article, uh, you wrote that for the Syrians' sake and for our own, we must not intervene. Has your opinion on this changed after the attacks this weekend? Yeah, I mean, by intervene, I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not at all convinced by a military solution to this uh, terrible problem. We've just seen these horrendous atrocities, despicable atrocities in Paris, where people who were at a gig with their friends, their girlfriends, their boyfriends, people who were at a restaurant eating, were, were murdered. Uh, and they were murdered in the most sickening way imaginable. The issue, you know, all of us were agreed that this needs to be defeated. The disagreement is how that is possible. And I suppose the problem I have is in the last 14 years since the so-called war on terror was launched in the aftermath of the, uh, the atrocities on, on September the 11th in 2001, the products, the consequences of those, that so-called war on terror, it can't exactly be called a success. I mean, jihadi groups are more powerful and extreme than ever. Al-Qaeda is on the brink of defeat, not at the hands of the West, but at the hands of ISIS, an even more extreme, murderous uh, group than their own with genocidal um, aspirations. So, you know, we've done lots of bombing and invasions. We invaded Iraq uh, with catastrophic consequences, which helped bolster these Islamic fundamentalists, indeed helped give rise to ISIS in the first place. Libya, again, the bombing of Libya, what have we ended up with Libya as a failed state overrun by fundamentalist Islamist groups. You know, over and over again, our interventions have bolstered these groups, not undermined these groups. So that's my fear. I also am very concerned about our, our, our alliances with fundamentalist dictatorships like Saudi Arabia, which don't just behead people for being gay and for being sorcerers and all the rest, just like ISIS do. But, and, and deprive women of basic rights and, and, and have no democracy, but they also export that extremism across the Middle East. And we're not dealing with that issue. Uh, we're not dealing with the fact they're at the absolute epicenter of this international extremism. So my view is the knee-jerk reaction, the instinctive reaction is understandable to drop lots of bombs, but there've been no shortage of bombs dropped in the last 14 years. And nobody with a straight face can say that the consequences of these military actions in the last 14 years has been a success from any point of view. Stability, security, peace, nothing. It's been a failure, a terrible failure, a terrible loss of life. And for me, there needs to be a political solution. Um, and that means, uh, in terms of Syria and Iraq, to bring on the Sunni communities to detach them from passive support for ISIS. That's what has to happen. Um, and that's my fear that that's not, that won't be addressed with, with a military solution. And people always come back at, oh, we've got to do something. Well, you know, if there was a burning fire here and I picked up a can of petrol and poured it on that fire and then you asked me, what the hell do you think you're doing? I'd say, well, we've got to do something. But that isn't necessarily the right thing to do in that circumstance. It's so tempting and obvious to talk about bombing. I say this a lot, but there's a quote I ascribe to Einstein, which is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. And with more bombing, I can't help but think of that quote. Yeah. Do you not think, though, possibly that even if it's with a different method of interve intervention, whether it be economic, political, however, or maybe even helping the Kurdish fighters, not Western fighters mm -hmm. in the area, that uh, the West has a moral obligation? Oh, the West, the, the Middle East. Absolutely, the West has to be proactive and involved. And what Syria, to solve Syria, needs the involvement of all its neighbours, players from Iran to Saudi Arabia, who are obviously involved in this terrible 
intractable conflict, which is killing tens of thousands of people, uh, as well as the West and Russia, all those players have to come together to settle on a political solution that can isolate ISIS. You know, we look at particular horror at what ISIS are doing from our standpoint because it makes sense. They've attacked us. Uh, they've released these videos which are intended to terrorise us. We often play into their hands by elevating them to this kind of monstrous level which they want and they crave. Um, but most Syrians have been killed by the Assad regime, not by ISIS, overwhelmingly so. Barrel bombs dropped in civilian areas killing tens of thousands of people. Um, and unless that is dealt with as an issue, then Sunni Syrians, there's people who are Sunni Muslims, many of them are not, they don't love ISIS, they don't like ISIS, but they fear Assad more. And unless that can be dealt with, then I can't see how there can be a lasting political settlement in Syria. Same in Iraq, many of the Sunnis fear a sectarian Shia majority led government in Baghdad. So they have to be dealt with, and I don't see how bombs will deal with that, even if ISIS are then removed from Syria and Iraq, which seems far-fetched at the moment, possible. That's not going to solve the problem either, is it? Because they'll all just come back to the West. We saw what happened in Afghanistan in the 80s when the West supported the Mujahideen. We'll continue on this topic of defence. Of course, one of the controversial issues in the UK right now is our nuclear deterrent, Trident. Uh, do you think that our deterrent should be maintained? Well, I don't accept the idea as a deterrent. Um, I don't think, you know, we've seen these terrible atrocities in France. Their nuclear weapons didn't deter those terrorist attacks. And the point, you know, it's not to be flippant. It's just the point that the threats we face today are not threats that in any way nuclear weapons can in any way hope to deter. My own view about nuclear weapons, which are weapons of mass destruction, which if used would wipe out the Earth several times over, and exterminate human civilization is that you know they pose a threat to us uh, we either won't use them and if we do then we will wipe out humanity and when people say ah well you know they do deter pre prevent conflicts that you know over the last few decades during the cuban missile cri crisis in 1962 it's worth emphasizing just how close we were to nuclear armageddon and that it only takes one moment like that to happen and that's it uh, there's no going back. We don't exist anymore as a civilization. We'll probably never recover from that. So uh, for me, that's too much of a risk. And um, I think that money would be better spent on schools and hospitals and jobs, on military defenses, which, which are actually appropriate for the big threats that we face today in terms of defense. Um, I'd like to see, you know, also the idea of a peace corps, which, the, which was set up in America under JFK. I'd like to see that in places like Britain as well, where you have, um, you know, you have kind of soft power which where you have you know British troops used um, for peaceful purposes and reconstruction things like that um, so I, I'd, I'd like I don't want to lose the skilled jobs that are involved with nuclear weapons but I'd like to transfer them to you know the the industries of the future instead I just don't think and also it's not the whole point about the British de um, nuclear weapon system unlike the French is we're completely dependent on the the United States. We can't launch nuclear weapons in any case without their say so, so it just ties us together with American power and subservience to American power. So in any case, the whole thing is just, it, it's, it's a farce. And, you know, I think in Germany or Spain or Italy, last time I checked, they haven't been nuked by anybody. They haven't been invaded by North Korea. They don't have nuclear weapons. If they don't have nuclear weapons, then I don't see why Britain has to have nuclear weapons either. Finally, do you think uh, to do with the Brexit, which is one of the big controversial issues in the UK right now, should it leave or stay in the European Union? Uh, where do you stand on this issue and do you think David Cameron's doing enough with his negotiations? Well, I'd like to see a reformed European Union, which is a social Europe, run in the interest of working people, not in the interest of big corporations. So, you know, I oppose the austerity that's been imposed across the Eurozone, which has been a disaster, particularly in places like Greece, but also Spain and elsewhere. Uh, particularly the impact on younger people, because one in you know half of all young people are unemployed in those places. A terrible, terrible disaster. Uh, but also things like the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, which has been negotiated in secret between the European Union and the United States. And what that does, um, TTIP, so-called, is it allows corporations to sue elected governments for policies they don't like in secret courts. So I object to that sort of thing. And also treaties which in, which basically impose free market dogma. It's very difficult in Britain to renationalise railways under EU law, for example, because 
there's a directive which uh, enforces competition on the railway. So there's those issues I'd like to change. What well, that's not what David Cameron's interested in. He's happy signing away British sovereignty and issues like the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership. He's more interested in in things which which he regards as sort of restrictive for, for the financial sector. You know, his idea of sovereignty isn't Britain; it's the financial sector, and they're not the same thing at all. Even though he treats them as though they are. Um, so I'd like he's not dealing with that issue. Um, he'd like to get rid of things like the social chapter if he could. Um, but his issue at the moment is talking about immigration, but it's all grandstanding because they're not going to be able to get anything on free movement of labour as things stand. Um, and all that means is, you know, they keep setting targets for immigration, which are massively exceeded. And all that does is undermine trust in the political process because they can't, as members of the EU, restrict the number of people coming in. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd, 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 like, I'd prefer to support staying within the European Union, but across Europe I'd like to see more solidarity to change the nature of the European Union. And the former Greek finance minister Yanis Varoufakis and others have set up this um, cross-European, pan-European movement to try and do that. So I'd like to engage with that, I think it's an important development. Um, so uh, yeah, and I think the other issue is a lot of the time people who oppose the European Union, they just don't like immigration, that's the issue. Um, that's not my stance at all, and I, I want to change it to make it run in the interest of people. And that means making it more democratic um, and stripping away some of the dogma about the free markets and all the rest, which I don't agree with. Yeah. Because another one of the big issues with the uh, Brexit is should uh, under, 60, well, not under 18, 16 to 18 year olds be allowed to vote in the referendum? A study at the University of Edinburgh has said that just 30% of the UK think this should happen. Uh, do you think that young people should be more involved in politics and why do you think so? And also, what advice would you give to any young people who hope to get involved in sort of journalism or mm -hmm. politics? I'd like to see 16-year-olds having the vote full stop. I'd have it as a quid pro quo, whereby you have civic education at, university, uh, sorry, at schools, because at the moment you often don't have kind of citizens' education, so people often don't know how democracy works and the political system works and all the rest. So I'd like to see a quid pro quo where you have that education and then in the turn, 16 year olds to 18 year olds could have the vote, uh, and 16, 17 year olds, sorry. And I think that would help build public co confidence and trust as well, if people thought, well, they're being educated in it now, you know, and all the rest. And I think having it at the age of 16 would encourage more young people to be more interested in politics at an earlier age, because they'd have to. Um, and also, uh, you know, it would be harder for politicians to attack young people, you know, like punishing them with debt for wanting an education, cutting away their benefits not dealing with issues like housing, which disproportionately affect younger people. So I, that's why I support it myself. I think that would be a positive move. In terms of young people who are interested in getting involved uh, in politics, for example, well, you know what? I, I think firstly, all politics is, is caring about the issues affecting you, your friends, your community and your country. And, uh, and, and young people are getting a bit of a kicking at the moment. They're often going to have a worse lot in life than their parents. And that's not happened for a, a century or so. And that's unacceptable. And, you know, on issues like getting a good skilled, getting a good, secure, well-paid job, um, not being punished with debt for going for wanting an education, um, getting an affordable home, a good affordable home. You know, these are issues that young people should, ha should expect, which are being attacked, and only by young people getting involved can that change. So I just say to young people, you know, join a political party, get involved, or join a one a single issue cause if there's one issue above all else you're really passionate about. You know, it does make a difference, and all the big changes in British and European history have been because people fought for them, you know, often at great cost. As for journalism, you know, what I'd always recommend to people is use social media, you know, blog, get out your thoughts, have a, if you've got a, you know, you think you've got a unique angle on an issue or, you know, you, you, you're you speaking out particularly, you know, we need to hear the voices of young people about their experiences at the moment. So blog, use social media, that's how a lot of people now start off in journalism and writing, by doing it themselves and getting a platform. Um, so I just think, you know, have the confidence at the end of the day. I think, you know, often it's about that confidence that your ideas and opinions are worth something. They matter because this is about your future and the more young people who speak out about their future, the better. So, yeah, I think the more young people who speak out and get involved with politics and journalism, the better, really. Okay, great. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today, but thank you very much for coming to speak. No worries, mate. Thanks. No worries. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.